tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about fateful fires and hollowed houses. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley, and tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Raphael Marmol and Matt Richardson are yours truly, Paul J. McSorley and Danielle Hewitt. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Raphael Marmol and is performed by myself, Paul J. McSorley, and Danielle Hewitt. In it, we meet a couple enduring one of the hardest things there is, the loss of a child. Unfortunately, their grief takes them in very different directions. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Their Souls Speak Through Fire. There's been no sunshine in life since the night of the fire. When Beth's mother volunteered to babysit Jenny for us, we jumped at the opportunity as we hadn't had a moment to ourselves since she was born. With Beth's postpartum depression and my overly demanding work schedule, our marriage was suffering. There was still love between us, though we never had the time or energy to express it. Instead of going all out, we made it a typical date night, dinner and a movie. Something to let us talk without earth-shattering screams, demanding our attention or another emergency meeting to talk about an upcoming meeting. A meeting about a meeting. How ridiculous. But that's life and business. Dinner went well. We talked and drank wine at a little trattoria we had meant to check out for a while. We joked and laughed, trying to keep the conversation lighthearted. I remember those moments fondly, as they'd be the last pleasant memories of our lives. Thinking about them now, I wish I could have said and done more. After dinner, we watched a movie. I can't remember which one. I tried my hardest to stay awake, but between the seafood fra diablo, a little too much wine, and the quiet movie theater... I fell asleep. Between work and taking care of my family, there wasn't time to relax. Beth let me sleep through it. Bless her heart. When the film ended, she tapped me on the shoulder and said it was time to go. She took her phone out of her purse and saw the onslaught of missed calls, voicemails, and text messages. What the hell? She immediately checked her voicemail. I checked my phone and saw an overwhelming number of phone calls from work and then voicemails and missed calls from numbers I didn't recognize. Something's wrong, I said, watching Beth's reaction to the message. Her expression was nothing short of full-blown horror. It made me immediately nervous and scared. There's been a fire at Mom's house. Beth stood up from her seat. We rushed out of the theater as fast as we could to the car and peeled out of the parking lot. 
Beth tried reaching her mother and got no response. We could see the plume of smoke in the distance. When we pulled down the street, the glow of the fire consuming the house filled the air. Neighbors lined the sidewalks, watching as the house burned. Beth bolted out of the car and ran toward the conflagration when we reached a roadblock of emergency vehicles. I slammed on my brakes and abandoned my car right in the middle of the road. I followed Beth as I heard a voice calling out for us to stop. We both ignored it until we reached the fire trucks. Beth stopped in her tracks to behold the inferno. The two-story home was engulfed in flames. A black and gray plume of smoke swallowed the sky. Firefighters sprayed torrents of water into the house, yet it seemed to make no difference. Beth collapsed to her knees. The world around me ceased to exist as I watched on, feeling helpless in the face of devastation. Hey, you guys can't be here! Firefighter yelled, approaching us from one of the trucks. Have you seen an older woman with a newborn? I asked him, hoping to get an answer. His face betrayed him. It was enough to see he didn't want to be the one to give the dreadful news. Beth looked to the firefighter as if he were God answering her prayer. The firefighter lowered his eyes to the ground and shook his head. We're still searching for them, he replied and turned back to the fire engine. Don't move. We'll come back here to tell you where they are when we find them. They had to have gotten out, Beth said, begging for agreement. Yeah, of course, I said, and turned back to watching Beth's childhood home burn down in front of us. As more time passed, the intensity of the fire raged on. Among the fires crackling and the shouts of the emergency personnel, there was a loud snap and an inhuman groan. It came from the house. Everyone scrambled away from the burning edifice when the roof collapsed. Beth screamed at the top of her lungs and charged forward toward the calamity. I took hold of her before she was able to get away. Let the firemen do their jobs. You'll see they're okay. They'll find them, I said, trying to console the two of us. I wanted to believe the lie as desperately as I wanted Beth to believe me. Holding on to the hope they were both okay kept me from losing my mind with grief. Beth pounded her fists against my chest as she screamed obscenities and curses at me. She's calling for me. Let me go. Can't you hear her? Let me go. Beth screamed into my face. It was impossible to hear anything with the commotion of more emergency personnel arriving at the scene with their sirens blaring. Beth fought to get out of my grasp, screaming and throwing fists and slaps at me. I held as long as I could before I realized Beth had clamped her teeth down on my forearm. She had broken skin and forced me to let her go. Beth raced toward the burning house, screaming for Jenny. When I tried to follow, a hand grabbed my shoulder. They got her, a policeman said. Two other officers and a firefighter swarmed her before she could reach the house. She fought against them, shrieking and flailing. Get off of me! Save my daughter! Can't you hear her? <laughs> the men dragged her back toward an ambulance and attempted to set her down. She wouldn't stop thrashing against them. Try to settle her down, the officer said, escorting me to the ambulance. If you can't do it, we'll be forced to detain her. Beth, please stop. They're only trying to help and you are distracting them. He's burning. <laughs> He's in pain. Ma'am, please calm down. The officer stepped in. Restraining you is costing us three men that could otherwise be searching for your little girl. We understand how you're feeling right now, but you aren't helping the situation, one of the firefighters added. Beth's eyes gave no indication of understanding. My wife was rabid, spitting and cursing like I've never heard before. There was only panic, anger, and a fierce determination to escape from their grasp. It made me question myself. I listened for Jenny's cries and couldn't hear them. No one else heard it either. Beth's raging insistence wouldn't stop. Nothing we could say would calm her. The police officer signaled for the three other men to hold Beth down. 
The paramedic inside the ambulance stepped forward and told Beth he was going to administer a sedative. It didn't even register in her mind. Beth was too far gone with grief. I didn't even try to stop them. After a tense few more moments, Beth started to deflate. As she slumped over and went unconscious, she mumbled Jenny's name and closed her eyes. She looked dead as they placed her inside the ambulance and strapped her onto a gurney. While I wasn't too thrilled with them sedating my wife, I understood it was the best choice for all. No one would have been able to stop her from going into the house, not even me. Beth had already taken up precious time and manpower with her lashing out. Before leaving, I left my phone number with the police officer and told him to call me whenever they found my daughter and Beth's mother. We pulled away in the ambulance and went to the hospital. There's nothing comparable to the pain of losing a child. There are no words to describe the feeling. How do you describe feeling like there's a hole inside you which will never be filled again? How do I adequately explain how a part of my heart and soul died with Jenny? The night we lost our child, we lost our lives. Nothing would ever be the same again. In my solitary moments, I replayed the night over and over again in my mind. Was there something I could have done differently? Could this have been prevented? What difference does it make? Reality is reality. Terrible things happen to good people all the time. It's a part of life which I've come to understand and loathe. While I hate to admit this, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say it. Plus, it doesn't matter anymore. I blamed Beth for wanting that stupid date night. I cursed my mother-in-law's departed soul for getting herself killed and failing to save my child. I hoped she rotted in hell. I've blasphemed and denounced God for taking my little Jenny away from me. In the end, I was angriest with myself for not being there to save my daughter. There was nothing anyone could have done about what happened. I know this now. I resented Beth for not being there for me while we were both grieving. She had shut down completely, overwhelmed with debilitating depression. She wouldn't talk or eat. It was a miracle she got out of bed to use the toilet. Days turned to weeks, and then months passed, and she wouldn't leave the bedroom. The curtains were drawn and never opened as she slept and cried away the night and days. Taking care of Beth emotionally drained me. She'd never have eaten if I didn't beg and plead for her to take a few mouthfuls of anything. Her skin was pale and she looked sickly. Her face had thinned as she had lost a considerable amount of weight. Dark circles permanently etched themselves under her eyes. The bedroom smelled of sweat and body odor. Then the night terrors began. She screamed for Jenny while throwing punches and kicks at the invisible police officers and firefighters holding her back. There were nights she yelled at her mother as if she was right there in the room with us. Being on the receiving end of these somnambulist assaults forced me to sleep in the guest room. Night after night, I'd be awakened by her screaming and have to run into the bedroom to wake her. This continued until Beth's suicide attempt. Being how my job was too demanding of my time, the company owner granted me extended leave as long as I needed it. With our savings depleted, there was no other choice except to return to work. We needed the income, and I welcomed a chance to get out of the house. It was terrifying to leave her home alone. I had spoken with her about it before, telling her I'd be going back to work. She'd have to take care of herself while I was gone. She didn't reply. Her only acknowledgement was a nod of her head before turning over to face away from me. I like to believe it was a cry for help. After feeling nothing except misery and sorrow, she wanted to feel something again. At least this is what I told myself. I know better now. Beth wanted to be with her daughter again and took the only action which would allow it to happen. When I returned home from work during my lunch break, our bedroom was empty. The house was silent. I called out to her and there was no answer. Searching every room of the house for Beth, she was nowhere to be found. 
except for the last place I didn't check. Neither of us had gone back into Jenny's nursery after the funeral. It was too painful. Too many memories lingered there. The door to the nursery was ajar. Beth laid naked on the floor of the nursery inside a circle of blood. Jenny's clothes and toys sat at different points of the circle, and a lit candle burned next to each item. They were all stained with blood. I shuddered, seeing Beth had fallen so far away from God in her grief. Jenny's bloody pacifier was in her mouth. Blood and tears covered her pale, thin face. Her wrists were slashed, yet she didn't appear to be in any pain. In fact, she was smiling. It was the first time in months I'd seen any expression on her face resembling a smile. And it made me want to die. Her breathing was shallow, but at least she was still alive. I called an ambulance and she was taken to the hospital. After the suicide attempt, Beth changed for the better. After getting treated for her wounds, she was held at the psychiatric department of the hospital. Her stay there made her realize she hadn't been coping with her grief properly. She was given antidepressants and attended therapy. After a while, we were able to get into marriage counseling and talk. Although we never spoke about the suicide attempt, that felt off limits. The curtains at home were soon opened again and the light shined into our bedroom once more. Beth ate without having to be coerced or pleaded with. She started taking care of herself again and seemed to have gotten over the hump of her suffering. She even adopted cooking as a hobby. She spent hours in the kitchen making delicious foods and baking. The night terrors stopped and instead we stayed up at night talking about Jenny, her mother, and our marriage. We cried, we hugged, and I felt love for my wife again. I didn't resent her anymore. Things were starting to get as good as they could in a world where my daughter was dead. At least I had my wife back and we could get through it together. Unfortunately, it wouldn't last. Beth's transformation bothered me. It was almost as if she was too normal. I couldn't put my finger on it. When mentioning Jenny, it didn't seem to upset her. In fact, she smiled when we talked about her. Her new hobby was taking so much of her time as well. It was like she was obsessed with cooking. She got up in the morning before I did to make breakfast. When I came home for lunch, she had already been cooking something up. Same with dinner. While this isn't abnormal, it became clear to me that she never turned off the stovetop unless we were going to bed. The temperature in the house was hot and bothersome. Our gas bills shot up hundreds of dollars. God forbid I asked if she wanted to order takeout or go to a restaurant. There was also the issue of the candles. Beth lit candles in every room of the house, even those which no one would be entering. With the way Beth had tried to kill herself, I felt uneasy with the candles. I had heard her on several occasions speaking to herself. I couldn't hear what she was saying. I assumed she was praying. Considering what she had gone through, I didn't mind these activities. They were harmless. If they made her feel better, I wasn't going to make a stink about it. It wasn't until I awoke earlier than usual one morning to discover the source of Beth's happiness. After using the bathroom, I went downstairs to grab a glass of water and caught Beth standing over the stovetop with the flames turned up as high as possible. Hello, baby girl. It's Mama. Say hi to Mama. Beth laughed and cooed at the flames as if they were our daughter. Then she started talking in a normal voice to her mother. I slowly crept back upstairs and listened as she continued. With Jenny, she'd baby talk and giggle a lot. With her mother, she seemed a bit colder and lashed out against her in anger. Once my alarm sounded, I played it off as if I had only awakened and began getting ready for work. Before leaving the bedroom, I checked the antidepressant bottle on her nightstand and saw it was full. I'd let her continue for the time being. It made her feel better and she wasn't hurting anyone, so there was no reason to stop it despite how crazy it might have looked. I'd let her continue to do it until it grew out of control. 
Beth started getting blistered and burned more often. At first, I chalked it up to cooking as much as she did and talking to the flames. As the injury's seriousness became more apparent, I confronted her about what I saw in the kitchen. I asked her to resume the antidepressants and get help. What she was doing with the fire wasn't a healthy way to cope. You cannot take her away from me again. She pulled a butcher knife from the block and slammed it to the counter. Without another word, I grabbed my keys from the hook and walked out the front door. As I walked out, I heard Beth comfort the flames, telling them that Daddy didn't understand. I spent the rest of the day at the movie theater watching movie after movie, even if they didn't interest me. Being at home with Beth would drive me just as crazy as she was, and I wouldn't let that happen. I thought about Jenny and Beth and my life now as it was. Beth was too far gone into whatever madness had taken her and needed help again. I couldn't help her. The helplessness hurt the most. I couldn't help Jenny, and I can't help my wife now either. When the last movie ended, I figured it was time to head home again. With Beth having threatened me with the knife, I would get my clothes and stay at a hotel for the night. As I walked out of the theater and turned on my cell phone, I saw over a dozen missed calls from numbers I didn't recognize. My heart went cold. It was the night of the fire again. I jumped into my car and sped home, knowing exactly what I would find. The investigation determined the fire was intentionally set and Beth was the main suspect. I couldn't argue with that. They found her body in the nursery where the fire started in Jenny's crib. I felt guilty for having left her alone, knowing her mind wasn't right. I blamed myself for arguing with her and trying to take away her coping mechanism, even if it was crazy. Once again, I found myself making funeral arrangements for another person in my family. Beth was buried next to Jenny and her mother. She was finally with her family again. Alone and homeless, I moved back into my parents' house until I figured out my next move. That's what I told everyone that asked. In reality, I couldn't continue to live with myself. The guilt and shame of losing another member of my family left me feeling like less than dirt. My nights and day were spent in bed, crying and sleeping. I'd see their faces in my mind's eyes I tried to sleep. I relived the fires in my nightmares and watched as their skin charred black and melted off their bones. Both my wife and daughter cried out for help. I heard them and ran into the flames only to be stopped by my mother-in-law who condemned me to damnation for not saving them. Then she'd lead me into a burning field. I'd see Jenny at the center of the same circle I'd seen Beth make. I tried to fight through the conflagration, but the candles would shoot out into a flaming wall, preventing me from getting to her. Beth would come up from behind with her mother and they'd walk straight into the circle. I tried to follow behind them, only to have my clothes catch fire. My family would watch from inside the circle as I burned alive. I'd wake up screaming apologies at no one. Life has been unbearable since their passing. Words cannot convey the drive and motivation behind someone's irrational actions so far gone in a state of grief. There have been days when I've found myself searching for Jenny and Beth's belongings, which I managed to salvage from our old house as ruins. The dreams are getting more and more vivid now. Beth is showing me what I need to do. Let's suppose I wanted to see my family again. In that case, I need to make two overlapping circles like a Venn diagram and place myself at the center. I'd need to be naked and there would need to be lit candles next to each item. Once I'm ready, I need to slash my wrists and feed them to the flames. Beth whispers to me to cut more, but I don't. It's all a dream. I think I'm going mad. Aside from the nightmares, fire is the only connection I have left with my family. I spend my days outside in the backyard with the fire pit going day and night. I try to hear them speaking to me, and I hear nothing. I contemplate performing the ritual. I reach into the flames, 
hoping one of them grabs my hand and takes me away to their fiery afterlife. My hand's burnt flesh is nothing compared to the joy I'd feel if I could touch Jenny or Beth again. I swear I can hear them speaking to me when the pain is at its most unbearable. I think I'm going to perform the ritual tonight. This morning, I'd heard their angelic voices calling for me to come to them. They told me they want to be a family again. I want to be a family again, too. I hope you enjoyed Their Souls Speak Through Fire, as written by Raphael Marmol and performed by Paul J. McSorley and Danielle Hewitt. You can also find more of Danielle Hewitt over on the Creepy Podcast at www.creepypod.com. Our second tale of the evening is written by Matt Richardson and performed by Paul J. McSorley. It's odd enough in a small, safe town when one person disappears. But when an entire family goes missing, one man joins us to tell the tale. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Drip. Everybody who is anybody in my small town could tell you about the disappearance of the Lechteler family. Some could probably write a book, more elegantly than me, because it's just one of those stories, a mystery with more questions than answers. But I'll do my best. The year is 1994. A man calls to reserve a room at the White Valley Hotel. He needs the reservation for the next night, and he will pay cash. Only cash. If he can't pay cash, he will speak to the owner, Billy, who is a known pushover and desperate for the money. The man is specific about the room. He needs number 13. No exceptions. No switches. He will require a king-size bed, two twins, and a bottle of brandy, wrapped in gift paper, ready to go on the dresser. He will also need towels and sheets for four. The desk and service staff go about their preparations. The bellhop drives to the store and buys the brandy. The maids shuffle two extra beds into room 13. They clean and clean and clean again because this is a new client who offered to pay cash no less, and business is bad. Business is always bad in White Valley. The next day, the Lechtlers show up. According to the bellhop, the father appears educated. He's older, middle-aged, with faded gray hair and a distinctive widow's beak. He wears thick, horned-rimmed glasses, the type that look permanently indented over the ear with a freshly ironed button-down shirt brown, clashing with black slacks. The mother, decked out in a floral print dress, ushers the wailing children like braying sheep. The Lechtlers have one boy and one girl. Each are under ten years old, and the young boy appears to be sick because his coughs and wheezes echo through the empty halls of the hotel as they approach the front desk. Mr. Lechtler hands over an envelope. The sleeve is filled with money. What he doesn't offer is an explanation, and the White Valley staff doesn't ask for one, just as Billy instructed. The clerk confirms the booking. The bellhop leads the family to their room. Number 13 is nothing extraordinary. On the surface, it looks like any other hotel room. A large and complicated armoire stores everything from extra power outlets to a mini-fridge. There is a bathroom at the back with a stand-in shower and a small coat closet beside it. An oak desk sits catty-cornered against the wall, and the king bed is decorated with plush pillows, a fuzzy blanket, and prototypical cream-colored sheets and comforters. A small window on the west side looks out into the lake below. The atmosphere can actually feel pretty peaceful, considering the modern circumstances, if it catches you at the right time of day. The lecturers thank the staff and say good night. When the bellhop leaves for the evening, Senior is perched at the desk with papers spread out in front and a fresh glass of liquor already at the ready. 
The bellhop assumes Mr. Leckler is a doctor. The clerk swears he is a scientist. It really doesn't matter at this point, because the end result is the same. By morning, every single member of the Lechtler family is gone. That's it. Gone. Nobody saw them go in. Nobody saw them go out. The room is made up. The bags are missing. The papers are gone. The twin beds have small creases in the sheets where the children must have sat momentarily, but the blankets themselves are completely undisturbed. The shower in the bathroom is damp. Somebody must have used it, but the towels are dry. They're just, well, gone. Vanished without a trace. The bellhop calls White Valley PD. Billy doesn't want to fuss at first. He insists that the guests probably just went out for a hike. Maybe they would come back, and then wouldn't they be furious, launching an investigation into something as simple as a breakfast trip? But he caves by dinner time. His employees are worried. The boy was sick. The woods are vast and foreboding. Anyone venturing out that late at night in the 90s risked something serious. The world was just a lot darker in those days. So they call the coppers. The police search the hotel with a fine tooth comb. Nothing turns up. They check the basement. Empty. They check the room. Nothing. They check the property. They check the woods. They check the lake. All a goose egg. They can't even find the kids' tissues for a DNA swab. Then they look into the name Lechtler, which also turns up zilch. So the cops settle on the idea that it could be a pseudonym. Back to square one. Soon enough, the police are actually asking the town for help, ridiculously, instead of the other way around. You can imagine the type of response this generated. Stories about the family volley around town like a game of telephone. Some people said the Lechtlers were spies. Some people said they were in witness protection. Some said they weren't human. And I don't even know how that began at all. But one story, perhaps the most disturbing of them all, the one that occupies the mind of every White Valley resident, is that the Lechtler family was murdered. They didn't like to talk about it, but everyone knew it could be a possibility. They had to. Families don't typically disappear on their own. Who could have done something like this? Who could have done it to children? The small town starts to lock their doors at night. A criminal investigation into Billy the owner begins a week later. The police trace Mr. Lechtler's booking call. They know that it originated from Billy's car phone. They know he advised his staff to accept the cash booking. Officers moved to bring in their primary suspect for questioning. But that night, a snowstorm slams the valley. Billy is out for an errand, allegedly to stock the kitchen, and doesn't notice finely packed ice holding over a pothole. Bald tires spin helplessly for traction. The front of his station wagon catches a maple tree. The back half dips down a ravine. Folks say they could hear the impact from a mile away. Town ambulances rush to the scene. The police are hot on their tails. Both are too late. Billy Walker dies from his injuries on the side of the highway. And so goes the mystery of the Lechtler family. Some people view the accident as an admission of guilt. He was running, right? He was a coward. He must have killed them. He probably dumped their bodies in the miles of wooded acreage that surrounded that creepy little hotel. The cops were just too incompetent to find them. Billy was a weird-looking guy. He made the perfect suspect. Call that discrimination or just plain distrust. Public opinion settles on its killer. Time passes without any fresh leads. The story sort of becomes local legend. They say that every small town has its secrets. And if that's true, none fits the bill better than the Lechtler's. The police close ranks and withhold information. The details warp over time. Some say Mr. Lechtler was an astronaut. Some say he worked for the CIA. Nobody knows for sure, of course. It's all conjecture. The bellhop and clerk are both dead by now. 
They leave behind their own family who add their own details. The truth rarely gets in the way of a good story. Certainly not in White Valley. Fast forward to today. The hotel still stands, obviously under different owners. A nice older couple bought the property at the start of the decade. The Abbots love the historical beauty of the old building. The hotel has its own stories, they insist. A rich and complicated history completely outside the Lecklers. The grounds were used by abolitionists, after all, and if it was good for them, it should be damn good for the brats of White Valley. The Abbots hire college kids and high school students. They pay us like shit. There are a few guests here and there, but business is just as dead now as it must have been back in the day. I worked the front desk on the night our little mystery finally got its answer. That evening, Mr. and Mrs. Abbott had some business to take care of out of town. Normally, they would trust the night shift to an older guy named Jed, but Jed was sick and the options for his replacement were few and far between. They settled on me, begrudgingly. We had four sets of guests staying with us for the night. Mr. Sloan was visiting his mother on Mott Street, but she only had one bed, so he elected to use ours instead. The Petersons were on a cross-country road trip, the Hinkies lost power in the recent storm, and Tommy and Sarah Measler, teenage newlyweds, were looking to stay in the only allegedly haunted spot in town. Number 13. I know what you might be thinking. Why didn't the Abbots board it up? Why did they still rent it out? The reason is really not that interesting. They needed the money. Any tourism is good tourism. Tom and Sarah were not the first to ask to stay in that room. Over the years, dozens of ghost hunters, psychics, or paranormal whatevers asked to rent the room 13 for the night. They came in with their cameras, EMF readers, and bundles of money at the ready. They left disappointed, but undeterred. Just the way we like them. On the night of my overnight watch, I posted up in the lobby with a big book and rum-filled thermos. I knew the hours would pass slowly, but I never expected to be so goddamn bored. I walked around the property and double-checked all my tasks. I took in the drifting snowstorm from the lobby. I hopped to every one of the guests' requests on the dime because it gave me something to do. But the calls died down entirely around midnight. And then it was silent. I kept myself awake by thumbing through an old short story collection by Stephen King. There was one in there about an upper-class woman who found a secret shortcut through the woods in Maine. Each time she arrived earlier than her gardener expected, and each time she refused to tell him the exact route. The author goes on to describe a night where they finally made the journey together. The route is winding. Trees and branches and roots are leaning across the road, making the course narrower and wilder. A creature jumps out, stranger than any the gardener has ever seen, and he swears they hit it. He claims to see it, stuck to the grill, but when he asks the woman, she just keeps laughing and driving and smiling mysteriously his way. Like it didn't happen. Like she didn't have another care in the world besides that rye. The phone rang. Have you ever been so captivated by a story that the fringes of reality disappear around you? I stared blankly at the receiver for a moment. I looked back into the snow. I couldn't stop thinking about the shortcut. Where did they go? What did they hit? Could such a place really exist? A place that gets you from here to there faster than ever before? The phone rang again. I answered it. The shrill panic of Tommy Measler's whiny little voice assaulted my eardrums. You have to come up here, he whispered. Really, man? Quick. Something smells like death. I chuckled. Sometimes the pipes in our old hotel backed up. Tommy would not be the first to complain about it. I grabbed a plunger and waltzed down the hall with the story still fresh in my mind. I wondered if the valley had a shortcut. Maybe there was a path through the woods to Fullerton. People always used to get lost back there. I knocked on the door. 
Sarah opened it immediately. She had a blanket wrapped around her face. Tom was in the corner with his head sticking out of an open window. I wanted to ask what happened, but a moment later, the smell hit me. And then I didn't have to ask. I can't use enough adjectives to describe this stench. It smelled like body odor and sweat rolled into a disgusting tortilla of old meat and beans. Have you ever left a piece of chicken or steak out of the freezer for too long until the maggots tear it apart? Take that stink and add a thick layer of something inexplicably sweet on top of it. I couldn't get it out of my nostrils. It invaded my lungs. I turned to gag and even then the rancid stench still stayed with me. We noticed it after check-in, Sarah started. We thought maybe just old pipes, but now? I nodded and proceeded cautiously to the bathroom, plunger out in front, brandish like a katana. Sarah paced behind me nervously. Then she shook her head. Not over there, she murmured. Here. She pointed to the closet. I'm scared to get my jacket. A lot of uncomfortable thoughts went through my head. My mouth felt dry and my throat spasmed uncontrollably. I walked over to the closet and thrust open the door dramatically. It was empty. Tommy shouted that they tried that before a fresh symphony of vomiting shook his frail little frame. I looked around and found the single light bulb in the closet. Tom's bulky north face sat parked next to Sarah's fashionable Patagonia. I moved them aside to search for something, anything, that could be the source of that horrible gut-wrenching odor. It had to be nearby. The sweetness seemed to get worse inside the closet. My fingers caught a break in the paneling. I pulled back, expecting it to stay in place, and fell on my ass once the entire wall came crashing down. Standing still as scarecrows were a mother and two children. A thousand wires were sewn into their skin and connected to batteries in the back. I looked down at my hand and saw a sticky, gooey substance, and I couldn't figure out why. It was only when Sarah screamed that I noticed the horrible ball of wax sitting beside the children. Entrails and blood were mixed together in a misshapen little pile of blood encased by a dusty pair of slacks and a faded button-down shirt. Sitting on top of the ensemble was a distinct pair of horn-rimmed glasses. I couldn't stop staring. Tommy couldn't stop screaming. A thick liquid leaked out into the closet and puddled by my feet. I turned to get the mop, absurdly, before Sarah's cold hand caught my shoulder. They're breathing, she whispered. Look. I focused on the woman's floral dress. For a moment, she stayed still. Then her chest inflated, her eyes fluttered, and she exhaled. I don't remember running from the room. I don't remember the phone call to the police. The only thing I can picture clearly is standing outside in the snow with Tommy, Sarah, Mr. Sloan, the Petersons, and the Hinkies. We were desperate for answers. We needed answers. But those are hard to come by in the valley. Mr. and Mrs. Abbott were devastated when the government seized the hotel. The suits called it eminent domain, and they gave a fair price, but it was barely enough to cover retirement. The poor folks had to move in with their grandson. For months, White Valley was swarmed by paneled vans and guys with sunglasses. The locals begged for answers in coffee shops and grocery stores around town. But the G-men stayed quiet. To date... No official explanation has been given for the disappearance and reappearance of the Lechtler family, and no one truly knows what happened to the surviving family members. Not even me. But a small town will always have its rumors. Some say that Mr. Lechtler must have been a scientist. Some say he could have been involved in cryogenics. Maybe the procedure had a shelf life. He was the oldest of them, after all and the first to rot. Billy must have known about the plot to some degree. Maybe somebody killed Billy. Wouldn't that be a twist? 
you can bet there will be a book about it somewhere. But it's not the mystery itself that haunts me. Not exactly. When I'm sitting up in bed praying for sleep, fighting the smell still stuck in my nostrils, I think about the children. Those poor fucking children. Were they awake? Were they aware of what was happening for all those years? Because if they were, I cannot imagine any worse fate than being trapped in a closet, completely helpless, while the rotting pieces of your father drip listlessly onto your shoulder. I hope you enjoyed Drip, as written by Matt Richardson and performed by your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley. Both of tonight's tales are brought to us by our friends at Velox. You can find more of these authors as well as many others by visiting veloxbooks.com. On to the shows. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>